An atrocity in broad daylight leaves one man believed to be a British soldier dead in London. We have had these sorts of attacks before in our country and we never buckle in the face of them. At the heart of this story, an apparent statement from a suspect who sounds like one of us trying to justify killing in Britain to further a cause thousands of miles away. Some of you may find the content of these pictures both offensive and upsetting. I, I apologise that women had to witness this today, but in our land, our women have to see the same. You people will never be safe. Remove your government, they don't care about you. What can we learn from what happened today in Woolwich? Also tonight... Kiss for the bride, please. We marry for love, so why is marriage or any other romantic arrangement of our lives any business of politicians? Yeah. It's nothing to do with the government at all. Why they want to poke their Nose. noses in. <laughs> I don't know. Few news events honestly merit the word shocking, but this afternoon's meat cleaver murder of what is believed to be an off-duty soldier in South East London does. The fact that his killers then danced around his body shouting God is great and inviting f photographs adds a further dimension, that one of them then ranted in a London street trying to justify the atrocity, aggravates the offence and the offence given. Mark Urban is our security specialist. Jeremy, now, yeah, go on. The, the Home Secretary tonight has condemned what she said is probably an act of terrorism. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner says they've launched a murder inquiry. Uh, bizarrely, just yesterday I was speaking to somebody in the world of counter-terrorism who told me that when they were looking at the Olympics, they had considered the possibility of a stabbing on a train, as he put it, by a militant. He said it, would, it was our nightmare scenario, we could do nothing possibly to stop a thing like that. Today it would seem that that kind of scenario unfolded on the streets of Woolwich. As you've said, some of the images that came out of it may be disturbing to some people. We must fight them as they fight us, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We are, I, I apologise that women had to witness this today, but in our land our women have to see the same. This is the man who attempts to justify murder while apologising that women had to witness it. Shocking footage taken by a passerby on their mobile phone. The attack was at 2.20. A man walking up the street was knocked down by this blue car that had mounted the pavement. The two occupants got out and started to stab and bludgeon the victim with a variety of knives and a meat cleaver. Hours later, heavy bloodstains on the pavement still marked the site of the murderous assault. Once the victim was dead or dying, his body was dragged into the road. I was on the bus coming into Woolwich and I saw a man lying motionless on the floor and there was a car with this body, so I thought it had been a road traffic collision. So I got off the bus and walked round to another viewpoint where the body had been covered up. There was a huge police presence, helicopters in the air. The two men alleged to have attacked him made no attempt to flee. Instead, they started talking to shocked bystanders. Some people tried to help the victim, while just feet away, a man with blood-stained hands made political statements to those nearby. Remove your government, they don't care about you. Do you think David Cameron is going to get caught in the street? When we start busting our guns, do you think the politicians are going to die? No, it's going to be the average guy like you. Local police were on the scene quickly, but it's clear they had to wait for armed officers to arrive, prolonging the bloody theatre as the perpetrators harangued local people. Witnesses suggest that once the armed police were there, the attackers rushed them. Two men, who we believe from early reports to have been carrying weapons, were shot by police. They have both been taken to separate London uh, hospitals and are receiving treatment for their injuries. These pictures show the attackers who, moments earlier, had been shouting Islamist slogans, lying wounded in the street. Get back! Get back! Tonight, there were fears in the community about tensions. Nothing ever has happened like this in Woolwich before and I think there are lots of different communities that live in Woolwich so I think some people will 
use this as a reason to attack these, these, this community that has done this to this man. Even as the assailants were taken to hospital, the Cabinet Emergency Committee, COBRA, was being summoned under the chairmanship of Theresa May, where it heard reports from the police and security service. The Prime Minister, meanwhile, who was on the continent for talks, made this statement in Paris. Tonight our thoughts should be with the victim, with their family, with their friends. People across Britain, people in every community, I believe will utterly condemn this attack. We have had these sorts of attacks before in our country and we never buckle in the face of them. The scene in Woolwich is the subject now of intense investigation, but there will be other lines of inquiry being pursued tonight. Did the attackers act alone? And had they at some point been under official surveillance? Well, our correspondent Richard Watson has for many years reported on terrorism and extremism in the UK. He's here now. Um, do you know anything about this uh, suspect? Well, I mean, none of this is confirmed at this stage, but about an hour and a half ago I received a very interesting phone call from a source uh, who knows the British jihadi scene very well. And uh, this source uh, said that uh, one of the attackers was Nigerian in origin, has been living in the UK for many years, uh, was radicalized by the Islamist group al Mahajarun in 2003. Uh, now, most controversially, he suggested to me that just last year, this young man was stopped or arrested, we don't know which at the moment, on his way to join al-Shabaab in Somalia. Now, I stress we can't confirm this at the moment, but that's what I've been told tonight. If that's true, he would be obviously known to the police. Well, that is the suggestion, yes. I mean, uh, that, that, you know, that is, remains unconfirmed. But if, if he is known to the police, of course, we open up the territory of what did they know about Mohammed Sadiq Khan back in 2005. It's that kind of territory. The, this attack, um, shocking, horrific, very, very different in character to something like the 7-7 attack. Yeah, very, very different. I mean, a, again, it's very early to, to say this with any certainty. However, if you look at 7-7, there were clearly strong influences in Pakistan in the tribal areas. Uh, Mohammed Sidi Khan himself went to travel out there uh, to get training and presumably final sign-off for the L London bombings. This appears to be a much more discreet uh, attack from lone wolves who seem to have taken upon themselves to carry out this attack, possibly radicalised by the internet. We don't know at the moment, obviously. Richard, thank you very much. Well, now, um, let's speak to the former Home Secretary, Lord Reid, to Lord Carlyle, who was the independent reviewer of anti-terrorism legislation from 2001 to 2011, and to Majid Nawaz, a former member of the Islamist organisation, Hizbut Tahrir, who later founded the Quilliam Foundation, a counter-extremist think tank. Um, Lord Reid, uh, this uh, is shocking, horribly shocking, but entirely unexpected, this sort of attack? Well, we know that we're under a substantial threat. We know that. We know that uh, there have been a huge number of plots in the past, foiled successfully by the security forces by and large. And we also know there's been a change from just being centrally determined and controlled uh, attacks throughout the world to more of what Richard Wilson called lone wolf attacks and makes it much more difficult for the security services because they tend to require less time in planning, they're more ad hoc, more opportunist, there's less communication data going back uh, across the world, there's less contact um, and therefore they're, they're more difficult to counter in a way. I mean in a sense uh, Mumbai was mm. in a sense that sort of attack mm. um, so if this is one of these lone wolf attacks, then uh, it's pretty difficult to counter. Although Mumbai actually did, if I recall correctly, there was evidence of control from Pakistan. There was, and in the big plot that uh, thankfully we foiled here in 2006, which was the liquid bomb plot mm. to bring down seven airliners with two and a half thousand potential deaths. There was certainly contact there internationally, which makes it a little bit easier to actually foil than a spontaneous attack without those communication links. Uh, your reaction, Lord Carlyle? Well, my reaction is, first of all, this is a tragic event and our hearts must go out to the family of the of man who was killed. Secondly, I think that this is the kind of attack which, because of Mumbai, we have been predicting for quite a time in this country um, and the control authorities, the police and the security service have been working very hard to prevent it. Mm. 
I think we have to learn proportionate lessons from what has occurred. We mustn't rush to judgment, but we must ensure that the police and the security service have for the future the tools they need which will enable them to prevent this kind of attack taking place. I hope that this will give the government pause for thought about their abandonment, for example, of the communications data bill and possibly pause for thought about converting control orders into what are now called TPIMs with a diluted set of powers. You're not suggesting that either of those things had anything to do with today's attack? No, I'm not suggesting they had anything to do with today's attack, but I'm suggesting that the powers that existed in the past make it more likely that other attacks can be prevented in the future. Lone wolves, even though they are always inevitably connected, at least with internet training, are very difficult to, to, to catch. So we must give the authorities proportionate tools to catch them. Majid Nawaz, uh, what really strikes you about this attack today? What strikes me about this attack is, in fact, the, the way in which it was, so much of it was theatre. So much of it was them standing around afterwards, speaking to members of the public to not only justify their actions, but to speak to the cameras uh, with a view to uh, knowing that the police were on their way, uh, almost in a fatalistic sense, wanting to be caught so that they could have a form of a show trial. Ordinarily, you'd expect that somebody's thinking, in a strategic way, would retreat and then come back to attack again, as the Boston bombers attempted to do. But these individuals wanted it to be about show. Uh, what I would say here, um, because I, you know, we've heard reports of members of certain far-right movements uh, seeking to move to the area and, and seeking vengeance. Uh, first thing, a lot's changed since 7-7, uh, the 7-7 bombings in London. One of the things that's changed is certain organizations that we were rather dissatisfied satisfied with in the past in the way that they uh, almost uh, didn't condemn terrorist attacks but instead started to focus on foreign policy have in this instance come forward and condemn the terrorism uh, with no ifs and no buts. The scene has changed among Muslim community groups and that's an important development. It's very striking when you hear that man speak. Here is a, here's a guy speaking in a London accent mm -hmm. about things happening in our country. I don't know which country he's talking about when, but this is really this is very weird. This is, the role, this is the role which we keep talking about that ideology plays and where we have abysmally failed, the international community and this country, where we have failed is in popularizing counter-narratives to this ideology that completely disconnects somebody who quite clearly speaking in a London accent and is willing to kill his own fellow citizens, probably for a country that he's never visited, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan, and he has more affinity to citizens in a third country than he has to his own citizens. And what we need to start focusing more on is in popularizing counter-narratives to make the ideology of Islamism mm. that politicizes the religion of Islam as unfashionable as Soviet communism has become today. Oh, I, I think I agree entirely and I think that the responsibility falls on government and this is not a political point at all to mm. try and help to create the counter-narrative. The internet for example has become a very powerful tool. One can learn how to make a bomb unfortunately on the internet. One can listen to sermons on the internet but we're not very good as a nation in creating a very strong counter-narrative which might attract people to the idea that the goodies actually what win. What would such a counter-narrative be like? Well, th there is a unit already in government, John Reid will know about it, which is uh, designated to examine the internet and try to help to produce a counter-narrative. Well, it's, it, well, it's the sort of thing that makes young men who may would, want to be radicalised right, okay. as keen to look at a, a contrary yeah, view. Mm -hmm. Counter picture as, as the right. terrorist narrative. First of all, Majib is right. At heart, this is an ideological battle. This is not about Islam. It's about Islamism. The ism is the giveaway. It is actually the political imposition of people's will through violence, through the use of a corruption of Islam. They have a narrative which basically, the Al Qaeda narrative, blames the West for everything and sees that as an anti-Muslim movement. We have not had a, an adequate narrative which explains the virtues of the society and the values in which they are based. And arising out of that narrative has to be action. And this is the point I would make about tonight's news that others are arranging counter demonstrations. The purpose of this action is not just to destroy life today. It is not even just to propagandize. It is to terrorize and to disrupt the normal flow of life in this country. Those who seek to attack other communities as a result of this 
will be carrying out precisely the sort of division and disruption of, of British way of life away from our communal collectivity that the terrorists seek to enhance in the first place. So those who might think that they are, you know, attacking the terrorists by marching through a Muslim community or whatever are actually following the path of the strategy the terrorists would like to see. Yes, I think it's very important that we should hear senior Muslim leaders uh, describing the kind of opinions that were expressed on that clip as a heresy and that it does not represent Muslim views in this country, which is right, isn't it? Absolutely. It doesn't represent anybody. It doesn't represent the They're majority. a bizarre and minority, but, but we must have this leadership. But, you know, one of my colleagues was speaking earlier to someone who was saying that he had been speaking to some young Muslims this evening who were actually pleased at what had happened. You know, this is what's, what we're finding, is that any, who, any young Muslim who's angry, the default political expression that is currently out there is this perversion of Islam that we refer to as Islamism. And the challenge that we have in front of us is in replacing that default. Now, when you ask about what the counter-narrative looks like, uh, there are ideas, there are narratives, there are leaders, and there are symbols. If I ask you, Jeremy, to think of the ideas and the narratives and the leaders and the symbols for Al-Qaeda-based extremism, you can very easily think of them. But if I ask you to think of the equivalent in the Middle East for mm. democratic activism, mm. who are the ideas and the narratives and the leaders and the symbols for democratic activism in the Middle East, you're very hard-pressed to think of them. Well, it's partly because there's very little democracy there. Uh, partly, and partly because the, the civil society activism involved mm. currently is stifled. People aren't a, as, as expressive for these values, the democratic culture, as they need to be. And that, that, you know, we need to do a lot more in that regard. It's, it's quite clear by now that, that increased drone strikes, targeted assassinations, uh, assassinations, more Guantanamo's and Abu Ghraib's, is the, the military option isn't the be-all and end-all solution. It's, it's a short-term stopgap. We need to start focusing on this idea debate and on reclaiming and rebranding democratic culture among young uh, disenfranchised Muslims. John Reed, let's just, just turn quickly to what's likely to be happening now. You have sat in Theresa May's chair, right? Too often, I yeah. fear. Um, there was a meeting of COBRA, the, 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 the cabinet committee today. Uh, that was what went on for some time, at the end of which it was determined it was a form of terrorist attack, we understand. Now, what happens next? Well, the first thing that happens is to establish the facts uh, and the Home Secretary will be surrounded by her specialists because the Home Secretary does not run these operations in a democracy. They're run by the police and the intelligence service and so on. But she is accountable to the public and parliament, so she has to ascertain the facts. Secondly, she will be asking the questions as to whether anything else needs to be done. Are there connections? Are there other suspects? Is there another threat from a group linked to this? Thirdly, about the uh, Ministry of Defence, I'm sure Philip Hammond was there. If it was a soldier who was tragically murdered today, and our thoughts would be with... Uh, his family and, and friends, if it was, what is the security like at specific areas targeted for soldiers and so on? And then there's a question about whether you need to raise the national threat level from substantial up to perhaps as high as critical. Um, I don't think that's likely, but that will be considered. If that is then raised, as a result of that, there's all sort of operational ratcheting up of defence measures. And all of that will be done in the first instance. Then they will uh, turn their mind to some of the, the, the wider questions, hopefully, um, which is not only the investigations that have been carried out, but questions like the nature of radicalisation of, of British people, the narrative that we talked about, the, you know, and that is an ongoing process. Sure. How alarming are the unknowns? The unknowns are always alarming. I mean, I've, I've chaired this meeting, you know, Cobra meeting, not only through terrorism, but through Litvinenko and so on. And uh, there always are, to use the words of one American former defence secretary, uh, you know, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And certainly in some of the cases in which I was involved, we thought we had a pretty good grasp for a while of the number and nature of the people involved, only to discover quite late in the day that there weren't six from this area, there was as many as 20 from another area. And that is where some of the measures which the government has refused to implement, like data communications that were mentioned earlier, is absolutely essential for effective fighting of terrorism. I mean, we, you, you will never find out whether you're right on this one until there is some 
huge tragedy that might have been averted if they had updated the communication uh, appraisals that can be carried out with very GCHQ. Briefly. Well, this is a very important point. Uh, we must have proportionate laws, but they must be laws that are sufficient to meet need. And when we see an example, and this may be a small example of something much bigger that could happen, we must ensure that the laws are fit for purpose. But we don't know whether the law, whether that sort of uh, interception of communications, monitoring of communications, would have made any difference at all. But we do know that it's extremely effective in catching organised criminals, murderers and others. We know it works. It's used and every day in this, courts Jeremy, up and down the country. Very right. quickly. Six, seven years ago, had we not had that uh, method of connecting people through their communications, Two and a half thousand people would probably have been blown out of the sky over the United Kingdom. Okay. It was a vital component, mm. but now people have moved on from mobile phones to internet, email, text and Skype. Um, we don't have the means of doing what we did six years ago. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, we'll return to this uh, story a little later in the programme. Now from hate to love. In all the noise about gay marriage these past few days, the bigger phenomenon, heterosexual marriage, has been rather overlooked. It is, we're told, the basic building block of the state, vital for the secure upbringing of children and an institution in trouble, which almost all political parties claim to be keen to support. Should it be privileged over other types of family life? Before we talk it over, Zoe Conway reports and begins with the question every couple gets asked. How did you two meet? The moment that you met. Moment? Oh, blimey, that's a bit hard to say. I just walked across the floor and asked my wife for a dance. Asked me for a dance, yes, and I said, I don't think so. No, I didn't. I did say I would. <laughs> I, I had to warn her about her small dresses whilst working behind the counter in the shop that I used to run. He was telling um, me I was showing too much leg and <laughs> I'd give the customers a heart attack. The tendency was in those days to grab the first female uh, that uh, you could and uh, kiss, give her a kiss on New Year's Eve. So I know exactly to the second when that happened. And we uh, just kissed and that was it. We, we just Within a month I knew this was going to be the one. If you want to understand married life, you need to come to East Dorset. Two thirds of adults here are married, the highest proportion in all of England and Wales. Are you nervous? Yeah. Not at the moment. <laughs> I'm okay at the moment. Yeah. Kaylee Wallace is surprisingly calm. Maybe that's because, like many brides, she already lives with the groom and they've had a baby together. Do you think? that you now feel that something fundamentally has changed yeah. yes. because you're now married. Yes. yes. What, what, what is that? Um, it just is feels that, like you've like not exactly found the missing piece of the puzzle. Yeah, you've connected yeah, it's together. It's another way of connecting, feeling closer. And it, it, I think it just bonds you together more because you're actually standing up in front of all your friends and families to and say, I am committed to this yeah. relationship. Kiss for the bride, please. Marriage has been in decline for decades. Roughly half the number of people get married today compared to 1970. 42% of marriages end in divorce. But the number of people cohabiting has increased dramatically since 1979. Today, one in six people cohabit. In terms of breakups involving children, fewer than one in ten married couples will split up by their first child's fifth birthday. For cohabiting couples, it's one in three. Do you think marriage is important for society? Yes, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. For people like Mark and Kaylee, and you know these two here, that definitely be together, be together, and it's good to be married for your children. You know, it's nice to have your mum and dad together. Unlike me, where I grew up, well, just a mother, so that's probably why I wouldn't get married. But not everyone's convinced that marriage benefits children. 
yeah. without the pressure of marriage some relationships work better you sound like you're talking from experience <laughs> I, was, I was married for seven years um, my husband left me a year ago so yeah we tried to stick it out for the children but it wasn't fair on them the UK has one of the highest rates of family breakdown in the Western world children in Britain are less likely to live with both parents than children in Germany France and the US. Fewer than 70% live with their mother and father. I remember how I thrilled at the sight of you. Oh, I remember. At Wimborne Bowls Club, more than 600 years worth of marriage is playing out on the green. Almost all of the couples playing have been married for more than 40 years. So how have they managed to stay together for so long? Is there something special about the institution of marriage that's kept them united? Or is it more about them as people, their characteristics that we need to understand? On that question, experts don't agree. Getting married is a different level altogether. You've got a very public commitment in front of family, friends, the state, uh, the community. It's clear and it's much harder to get married and it's much harder to uh, get out of being married. And so there's a very public commitment there. Couples that get married have different characteristics to couples that choose to cohabit. Um, we can observe some of them very easily. For example, we can observe that couples that choose to get married have higher levels of education, they have higher professional occupations, um, they are more likely to own their own home and have higher incomes. And lots of these factors will contribute to whether they um, separate or not in the long term. Marriage amongst high income groups is on the rise. 66% of people in the top social class, such as senior managers, are married. Whilst only 44% are married in the bottom social class, which includes manual workers. So does this mean there's a financial barrier to marriage? Lorna and Bill Foreman have been married for 55 years. They think young couples could do with some help from the government. Times are not no, easy at the moment. No, they're not easy. For most couples. And even if they're living in a flat, they need something. You've still got to buy furniture and that's what, anything to help people get started, that's it. And, but I know these days people um, start off and they get married and they want everything. I mean, we started, we got married, we had a bed kitchen table and two chairs and when we had visitors they sat on boxes and things because we didn't have because we couldn't afford it but look at you Len you brush up nice <laughs> yes it doesn't look bad I mean you can see can't you why mm -hmm. I fell for him well, I mean, and this is let, let's face it I mean she was a, a smasher Len and Diana Pierce have been married for 62 years do you think but is any business of the government, whether mm. people are married or not? No, no business not at, at all. all. No, at all. Definitely not. No. It's a personal thing between the couple. Yeah. It's nothing to do with the government at all. Why they want to poke their no. noses in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. Arguments may rage about what this certificate means. But perhaps it's laughter that makes a marriage worth the paper it's written on. <laughs> My wife had a hip operation, right? Oh. And when she came home, they'd given her a mechanical fingers to put her knickers on. So I said to her one day, that's bloody stupid, what are you doing that for? I had to put your knickers up. And I got them halfway up and I thought, bloody hell, I must be old because I was trying to get these off years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put that on television for God. <laughs> well, now, here to discuss the ins and outs of uh, marriage are Harry Benson from the Marriage Foundation, a group that campaigns in favour of marriage. Not surprisingly, Claire Pay, a campaigner for Mothers at Home, at Home, Mothers at Home Matter, sorry, Mothers at Home Matter, uh, Dahlia ben Garim from the left-leaning think tank, the IPPR, and Fiona Miller, a journalist who, for her sins, lives in what used to be called sin with the spin doctor, Alistair Campbell. Now, what business, can you answer that question that that couple were perplexed by? What business is it of the government, whether people are married or not? 
It's a great question, and of course you'd think if, if all relationships were the same, then it, it wouldn't be, make any difference. But the government is deeply involved in family life already. If I took you into a, a, a secondary school and I introduced you to 100 teenagers who are about to start their GCSE exams, of that 100 teenagers, you'd find that 45 of them are not living with both their natural par uh, natural parents. And that's where the cost of family break breakdown has spiralled out of control. 45% of kids are now living um, without their natural parents, and the state spends an absolute fortune, quite rightly, protecting and supporting uh, lone parent families. Fiona um, Miller. Am I supposed to respond to that? Or? Yes. <laughs> Well, I think there are the re if you're talking about the reasons children don't achieve, they're very complicated. And I think we, we know there's a correlation, don't we, between uh, married couples, couples that stay together and outcomes for children. We don't know that there's a causal link. And I think there are a lot of other reasons why children don't achieve. And the, the state has a, has a business looking into people's or uh, uh, having policy for people's personal lives mm. and family lives. But it be, should be to support families in what of, whatever form they come, not simply families so who are in a marriage. So don't fetish, fetishise, to use the wrong word, but, but don't make a big deal of marriage. I think we're talking about, is, you're talking about stability and commitment for mm. children. And there can be stability and commitment, even with a, a couple of parents who separated. Why wouldn't you just penalise people who get divorced then? <laughs> the government could find people for getting don't, divorced, couldn't Don't they? you think people are penalised enough when they get divorced? No, let's look at what works. Um, of the 55 kids that I've introduced you to in, in, in year nine who are about to start their GCSEs, of those 55 kids whose parents are still intact, 51 out of 55 are married. It's the model that works. And um, gorgeous Fiona here, who's managed to make it work for all these years, is very much the exception. No, if I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's true. But if you're going to make a policy Which based on... Which not true. I don't think I'm the exception, because there are a lot of successful family models that aren't, no. don't involve marriage. And, yeah, okay. and I do think it's about the quality of the relationship rather than necessarily about the status. And we know that you know, children do well in loving, warm environments, mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be married environments. It means that they, you, know, you need to support the quality of that relationship and the stability in that household um, you know kids will do much better in a household where it's loving and warming rather than if it's it's in a married household where the parents are in conflict and arguing all the well, time what is it specifically about marriage that makes it a better environment to bring up children in it's the commitment it's the stability I think Harry has mentioned the uh, statistics behind it that you just are more likely to separate if you're cohabiting than if you're married. To get married, at some point you've discussed your long-term future. You've said, I want to marry you. You haven't just ended up living together and then carrying on because nothing else has happened in the meantime. You, you've discussed it, you've committed. And, um, and you are married. But I, sorry, but I do think that, you know, to compare people who are cohabiting to those who are married is, is not a like-for-like -like comparison in a way. Most people now cohabit before they choose to get married, if that's what mm. they choose mm. to decide. And so it's not really comparing like-for-like. -like. So it, it's kind of unfair to say that those who are cohabiting, you know, have a different range of... The data is more complicated than mm. that, I think. Fiona, I mean, I, tell me to back off if I'm prying here, okay. but why did you dis make the different decision, which was the decision okay. not to get married? Well, I, I th I've always felt that marriage was a bit of a patriarchal institution. I didn't like that aspect of it. I'm not religious. The ceremony doesn't appeal to me at all. And I mean, it's interesting because since your researcher phoned me up last week to talk about this program, I've thought about the reasons more than I have done in 33 years. I could never think of a good reason to do it. It wasn't there was a reason not to do it, but what was the reason to do it? We had a commitment to each other. We've got three children. You know, we had our ups and downs. Well, chronicled in his diaries. So I'm sure many people know about them. Um, but you know, we stuck together over 33 years, and I think that is a form of commitment and stability. And I, and I, frankly, I find it quite offensive to hear from politicians that our form of family life is any less valid than somebody who happens to, you know, have a regular. Just what, thing perhaps they're not the saying that. Perhaps they're merely saying it's slightly more vulnerable. Well, I think if you've got the commitment is there, it doesn't matter whether you're cohabiting or married. And I think you have to look at the underlying reasons why people stick together. And I'm not sure that the marriage this is like ceremony is it's the not reason. Very far There's away a from correlation, but is that the cause? Sure, but you, you are more or less assuming, are you not, that children are better brought up, brought up by two parents no, than by one? I'm not at all assuming that. I mean, it's the choice that we've happened to make, and I think a lot of people do make it, but I think I can think of many successful families that don't have two parents, and the children achieve extremely well. And I think, again, it's, you have to be very, very careful about making these judgments about what is the right type of family model and what is the wrong type of these family model. These judgments do seem to be made all the time. If we were to take your argument seriously, what mechanism do you think should be imposed to try to get people to get married and stay married? 
Well, I think you can't get away from this basic fact that 51 out of 55 ki kids in this case are living in intact married families. With, uh, You've said with that. Yeah. Come on, tell us how you think the government could get people to get married and stay married. Okay, well, the first thing is that the current government policy actually penalises married couples. And the reason it does that is, is particularly at the low end, is when you're, if you're receiving tax credits, um, if somebody moves in with you, then you, their income comes into your household and you lose your tax credits. So there, and that's called the couple penalty, and it's very, very well known. I spoke to a mate of mine this morning who's happily married, and he said he'd already worked out that if his, he and his wife split up, they'd be so much better off um, than, than if they were living together. And that's utterly mad. A marriage tax break would be one of the ways of righting that wrong. Uh, and how much money do you imagine it would take to persuade someone to get married and stay married? Well, I don't know if it's necessarily the amount of money that you need to persuade someone to get married, because well, we give child you're benefit. You're the one who's going on about it. Well, we give, we give people child benefit, and it doesn't cause people to have children. We pay pensions, and it doesn't cause people to get old. But, so well, giving a marriage tax break would be a good thing, because it's a good thing, because most people who actually make their relationships work um, are married, and the state would then be recognising that. Is there any way of measuring what is a financial inducement that will get this, what is perceived to be, good thing in the government's mind to work? I don't think so. I mean, I, I find it very hard to believe and, and haven't seen any evidence to support that people would either get married or stay married because of a marriage tax break. I think, you know, what we're seeing and, and relate, for example, uh, the charity are seeing an increase with people under financial pressure, uh, financial pressure coming to them. And I think it's about supporting families at time of financial pressure for mm. affordable childcare, um, shared parental leave. Those kinds of policies, I think, would have a far greater impact um, than something like a marriage tax break. Would, would you, uh, David Cameron's talking about something between £150 and £200. Would you get married for £150? <laughs> not, <laughs> not because David Cameron told me to, that is for sure. <laughs> but I mean, £150. Say pounds, that to no, £150, <laughs> pounds, probably not. No, but I mean, I, at my yeah. time of life, you know, coming through the other end, my children, will, our children are grown up now, there is a, a great advantage in being married because of the, the situation with inheritance tax. And actually, I think we should be equalising the situation so cohabiting heterosexual couples can have civil partnerships as well, because that seems to be very unfair now. That you, I'm, in fact, penalised now. Do you think that couples should stay together for the sake of the children because it's a better environment? I think the ideal situation is where you have a couple who are happily married, who love each other, where they can look after their children the way they want to. So if the mother want, or father wants to stay at home full time, they can. If they, one of them wants to work, they can. And that is a, a fantastic environment to bring children up in because it's well, I mean, stable never, and never It might exist. But most well, of us have to make compromises in life. But I think you can look at what the ideal is and then say, well, how close can sure. we get to that? And I think it doesn't deny the fact it is the ideal. If you can have a couple who are happily married, mm. who are committed to the children, who remain committed to the children throughout the children's lives. Do you think that a single parent bringing up a child is necessarily less capable of doing a good job? Not at all. Not at all. As you said, many well, in that people case, are why not... worry about it? Because it's... <laughs> It's great if you can have a father and a mother so you assert. living together. So you assert. Where's the evidence? Because it, when you have parents living together, you, you develop attachment, you develop bonding with the children. I, I have to say, sometimes my husband works away, and it's much easier when he's around that the children get a, a balanced approach to being brought up. They have the male version and the female version, and, uh, and that works really well. It's very hard when I'm What's on my own. What's the evidence own. on this? Well, I think families are far more diverse and, and there's a much, you know, I don't think that that's, you know, families thrive in different environments and I think when people are able to make choices that work for them, that's when kids do really well. That's when you get a loving and supporting home that children and couples or people on their own who make that decision uh, thrive in. But at the moment, a lot of families can't make the choices that they want to make because if you... Um, have a single income family, you, you're much more uh, penalised in the tax system. You, single income families uh, pay a much greater proportion of tax than um, dual income families. If you're earning £36,000 as a single income family, you're going to be paying £2,500 more in tax than if you're a dual income family. So actually a lot of people can't afford to stay at home to look after the children or work part time. They, a lot of people do have to work. So, some They're not happy. Couples. Sorry. In some cohabiting couples, people stay at home and look after the children. I think there aren't any hard and fast rules about this. And I think what Claire's trying to say is, I mean, I think if, if parents separate, I think it is partly the role of the state to help to support that family, to maintain good relationships with both parents. What we're saying is it's important for children to have a relationship 
with their, both parents if they can do in, the, in those situations. But when, sometimes it's not necessarily the right thing for people to stay together at all. When you look at the growth in divorce and when you look at the growth in cohabiting couples, children born out of wedlock, and the, the fact that there is no longer any kind of stigma really against mm. either divorcees or bastards, that there's no stigma uh, that any no. longer that attaches this because, as you say, children see all sorts of models in school. Is this a bad thing? Surely it's a good thing. Well, I, I just want to pick you up, if you'll forgive me, on Please, this, on this business of, of there being more divorce. There isn't more divorce. There hasn't been more There's divorce. There's a lot more divorce than there was in 1950. Uh, well, yes, compared to 1950, but compared to 1980, that's not true. And we've seen, we had a, a one million lone parent families in 1980. There are two million today, and we have, ha we have less divorce today than we had in 1980. You have to explain, if it's all these background factors no. that are supposedly um, the, res the reason why families are splitting up, then you have to explain why family breakdown has doubled. It's the trend away from marriage. That is the reason why we have our 45 out of 100 but, kids but, who are living without both natural parents. I mean, one of the fascinating things actually is the success of marriage, even now, because when you think that there isn't any stigma attached to being unmarried, there aren't really the economic reasons for women to have to get married anymore, yes. and yet yes. so many people are still getting married. I mean, I think you should be celebrating the fact oh, that it's still so popular. You're going with the grain of human behaviour. Yeah. You should, we, yeah. Government policy but should don't go judge with the people grain. who don't make that decision. I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not at all judging. But I'm just simply that's, saying that's that the way government, the policy, are no, government policy should go with the grain of human behaviour, which is that we want to stay together as couples. Few people set out wanting to be lone parents. We should support lone parents. And we should support but marriage as well. It's stigmatising for lone parents to be told that the married couple model is the best one and the one that works best. If, if you hear it that way, yes. But well, I actually, think a lot of people do hear it that way. I hear it that way. I've been living with the same person for 33 years. I've got three grown-up children. And what I hear is that hmm. my, our model of family life and parenting and a relationship is not as good as somebody else's model. Well, That's let me say categorically, on behalf of myself, my family, the Marriage Foundation, and anyone who represents marriage, I love lone parent families. We should not support lone, lone parent, parent families. families. <laughs> no, but we should support lone parent families, <laughs> but we should also support married families as well. You can do both. And marriage. unmarried families. No, because this is the model that well, doesn't work. That's the work. problem. But no, come on. Okay, if, 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 I, if I told you that my uncle had, had died aged 90, having smoked 65 bags a day. Um, then he's the exception, not the rule. But you I can't go around telling everyone to smoke just because he's done okay. But I think the Fiona's done brilliantly, but she is not. The, she is the exception. And lots of marriages but fail I too. Yes, they do, but very, very few, tiny numbers of unmarried couples make it through. If you, mm. it's difficult. Everybody knows it's not difficult. Not tiny numbers. But that's why it's that's smaller why proportion than no, it marriage. Is it's not but the numbers are different to begin with, so you can't compare married yeah. to cohabiting mm. families. And I just think you have to accept, you know, and, and reflect that society is different and there are far more you know, different family types and, and people are making choices that work for them and it's dynamic. Not everyone will remain in the same um, relationship status throughout. You know, they will change and different environments will work differently. But one of the reasons Fiona's here, other than her great contribution, is that we are slightly surprised that someone who's been cohabiting for 33 years is still together. She's, she's making well, a I point. I don't know why you're you surprised know. at all. I mean, no, he's absolute that... pussycat, really, aren't you? <laughs> <he's> so <laughs> yes, knowing her partner as we do. Every single but, um, th this is yeah. this is the point. If you had a married couple who'd been married for 33 years, that would be less significant. But we've looked for someone who has been cohabiting for 33 years and made it. So obviously, your model is well, all my is all my fine. married friends are now divorced. Ah, is it, right. it choose your friends wisely. You've got to okay. go with the all data. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you all very much indeed. Well, now uh, let's return to our main story which is the attack in broad daylight this afternoon in Woolwich, where a man believed to be a British soldier was hacked to death. The Home Secretary says it was an attack on everyone in the UK. After the attack, the two men were shot by police and are now under armed guard in hospital. Well, now, Richard Watson is here again. Um, what are the options the government's going to be looking at now? Well, I think um, they'll be taking a very close look at the Preventing Violent Extremism policy, which has been in place for some years now, called Prevent for short. Um, this is a policy designed to encourage people in the Muslim community especially to come forward with community intelligence when they have information about extremists in their midst. So I think an early question now will be, who do these men know? They've been around since 2003, that's for sure. They converted to Islam in 2003, so I'm told, so my source tells me. Uh, so where did they pray? Who knew what they were doing? Did anyone know their extreme, if they held extreme views? And did they report it uh, to the police? There is one note of caution from another source of mine tonight who said to me, look, we have a serious problem in the UK at the moment because uh, he was speaking to some 
young British Muslims today after this attack, and they actually, actually expressed a, a certain satisfaction to him about today's attack, saying this was a good thing. Very shocking if true, and I think it shows the depth of the problem that we do face. Uh, although they could be, a, they, well, they are a totally unrepresented minority. Oh, yes, you know, uh, absolutely, a tiny minority. Mm. But even though they're a tiny minority, if you have these views, even amongst a handful mm. of people, it presents a serious problem to the police and the security service. Richard, thank you very much indeed. And uh, not surprisingly, this uh, terrible attack is on the front page of many of all of the newspapers, I think. The Daily Telegraph, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's uh, the, what this uh, man said. Uh, the Independent, uh, it's a similar picture, and also on the front page of The Guardian. You people will never be safe. Uh, he's also on the front page of the Daily Mail, and uh, the Daily Express uh, manages to combine it with the picture of... Uh, uh, pregnant Duchess of Cambridge. Um, right, that's, um, that, that's it. Uh, we'll be here again tomorrow. Until then, good night. Good evening. A cold wind blows across the country through tonight into tomorrow. Heavy showers to northern and eastern areas, one or two further west and south. Most though across England and Wales start the day dry with a bit of sunshine. Cloudy conditions in the north, but that will all filter down on that strengthening wind. So even if you leave the house with a bit of sunshine overhead, it won't stay that way. Large amounts of cloud throughout the day in Northern Ireland and Scotland. The showers in the afternoon maybe not quite as heavy in the mo as they will have been in the morning. There will be some winchiness though across the higher ground and with winds touching.